Vincenzo Pipino, the thief of Venice anime geeks, may already be acquainted with the series known as Lupin the Third. In it, a classy male burglar and his team of bandits work together to steal priceless goods. There's hijinks, hilarity, and once in a while, touching moments, too. The character of Lupin has remained extremely popular in otaku culture, even though the manga is decades old, and much of that deals with the dashing persona that the titular character has. Lupin III himself was supposed to be the Arsène Lupin, a gentleman thief best known from Maurice Leblanc's novels, The Gentleman Thief Unveiled. The trope of The Gentleman Thief is one that appears too good to be true. Real life couldn't possibly have thieves that are sophisticated, charming, witty, and oddly morale while also being adept at theft, could it? Guess again. Not too long ago, there was a real life version of a gentleman thief. His name? was Vincenzo Pipino, and he was only recently arrested on unrelated charges. From Very Humble Beginnings Vincenzo Pipino was not a wealthy man. He was born in Venice after World War II to a struggling family who often had a hard time finding food to eat. He was one of five children in his family, the oldest to be precise. Like other young children after the war, Vincenzo found himself in a world that was best described as anarchy. There was little parental supervision to go around and even less discipline. To pass the time, he'd hide in alleyways and explore the city streets with his siblings. And they'd get hungry. Vincenzo quickly noticed that he was adept at stealing food from wealthy diners' plates when they were eating at outdoor bistros. It didn't take long for police to recognize Vincenzo's antics and start chasing him through the floating city's streets. The adults may have been fast, but Vincenzo always remained more agile. Within a matter of years, Vincenzo's speedy hands and runner's legs made it easy for him to become a master pickpocket. He'd regularly spend nights outside looking for ways to steal and perfect his craft. His brother Alfredo was also known for his speedy hands. But unlike Vincenzo, he used his hands for magic tricks. Once in a while, Alfredo would tutor his brother to become better at feats that required sleight of hand. It wasn't that Alfredo didn't have a desire to join Vincenzo on his exploits. It was that he just didn't have the talent it took to be a runner. Alfredo said it best. I was born to be a magician. Vincenzo was born to be a thief. Alfredo Pepino, The Golden Leg Vincenzo's mother was not pleased about her son's thieving prowess. And really, what parent would be? Being a crafty mother, she decided to use her son's fear of ghosts to try to dissuade him from staying out on the streets of Venice and stealing. So she claimed that their apartment building was haunted by a neighbor who tripped on a stair from a bad leg. The ghost, which she called Gamba di Oro, or The Golden Leg, would glow in the dark and catch boys who were out too late. Vincenzo, being an outside-the-box thinker, decided that he should avoid the golden leg ghost by scaling the side of the building to get into his home. And so he became an expert climber, Venice's Robin Hood. Most modern-day thieves are interested in one and only one person, themselves, but not Pipino. Even from a young age, he would give his spoils to people who weren't as well off or would actively seek out people who could afford to lose some items. When he was a teenager in the 1960s, he'd sell movie tickets he stole for cheap so that local kids would be able to see films. By the early 1990s, he acted as a burglar who would steal from Venice's wealthy, then resell his stolen goods to them in order to raise money for the poor, as well as himself. If this sounds like a modern-day Robin Hood tale, that's because it was. And unlike most other men who tried it, Pipino managed to somehow strike a very careful balance between the rich, the mafia, and the police who tried to catch him. A moral code unlike any other part of the reason why Pipino was able to get away with his thefts was his moral code. You see, Vincenzo Pipino held himself to a very strict code that was designed to reduce the damage that his actions caused and keep Venice's overall economy intact. When he would break into the wealthy's homes, Pipino would make a point not to make a mess. He even was known for pouring out sugar on a napkin rather than letting it spill on the floor. In terms of his target heists,
Pipino was equally picky. He wouldn't steal any item that was broken, out of concern that it could cause repairmen in the Venice area to lose business. He also wouldn't steal from the poor. Any truly priceless artifacts would also find their way back to the homes they were stolen from, if the victims chose to buy it or if Peppino himself wanted to be charitable. Hired by the Rich Believe it or not, this gentleman burglar wasn't acting on his own most of the time. Many aristocrats hired him to rob others in their circle. Some of his clients included Count Barozzi, who was known throughout Venice for his incredibly large art collection. At one point, being robbed by Vincenzo Pipino was seen as a compliment by the rich of Venice. The police, knowing that it was seen as a sign of good taste to be robbed by him, had an unspoken agreement with him about catching him. Loved by police. By duty alone, the police were supposed to hate Pipino. He was breaking into people's homes and stealing from them in broad daylight. However, his charming demeanor, no harm, no foul style of thieving, and mellow outlook on life made it hard for people to hate him, cops included. It was the police's job to catch him, but that doesn't mean that they went out of their way to do so. In fact, many befriended him because his personality shone that much. One such man was a very frustrated detective, Antonio Palmosi. The two were known to drink coffee together, taunt one another, and also act as frenemies. Palmosi still doggedly tried to catch Pipino in the act, but never could. Pipino's Preferred Plunder While Pipino may have gained fame for his art heists among the affluent during his adult life, there was something else that truly tugged at his heartstrings, exquisite clothing. In the alleys of Venice, locals grew accustomed to witnessing his dapper figure making a hasty retreat on a boat, arms laden with cashmere and other luxurious garments. To some extent, it even became a running joke in the city. Mafia Tensions and an Insurmountable Dilemma it's only natural that the local mafia known as Mala del Brenta eventually caught wind of Pipino's remarkable thieving skills and attempted to recruit him into their fold. However, Pipino felt ill at ease with the notion of collaborating with them, further fueling their ire. The mafia was notorious for its brutal ways, and the items they pilfered rarely found their way back to their rightful owners. If Pipino consented to work with them, it would surely upset the delicate equilibrium he had painstakingly established between the police, the wealthy, and the mafia. If he declined, he could potentially pay with his life, but if he agreed, it might spell the end of his illustrious career. How could the gentleman thief of Venice navigate this treacherous tightrope? A Solemn Commitment Acknowledging that he was outmatched by the Mafia, Vincenzo Peppino couldn't outright reject their offer. Instead, he concocted a plan that would not only win their favor but also secure his release from their grasp. He approached local mobsters with a proposition. The specifics of Peppino's plan left everyone astounded. He disclosed that he would undertake a solo mission and the identity of his target would remain a closely guarded secret. His most ambitious target, Utrar. The Palazzo Ducal, also known as Doge's Palace, was one of Venice's most exquisite museums, boasting some of the most rigorous security measures in all of Italy. Pipino didn't settle for any painting. His mission was to purloin the Madonna Col Bambino, a national symbol representing Venice's divine authority. It was a heist fraught with an extraordinarily high level of risk even for a true gentleman like Pipino. Fully aware of the perils involved, he resolved to go it alone. The Grand Caper. To initiate his audacious heist, Vincenzo Pipino joined a large tour group visiting the Palazzo Ducale. As the tour progressed through the palace's prison section, he deliberately lagged behind and eventually concealed himself in a small, overlooked corner of the prison. There, he waited patiently until the palace concluded its daily tours. He remained isolated in the cold, damp darkness for hours, 
a remarkable feat for someone with a fear of ghosts and the dark. Observing the guards making their rounds every 45 minutes, he identified the opportune moment to execute his plan. The room housing the precious painting had just enough marble columns and shelves for Peppino to conceal himself, but the painting itself hung about 14 feet above the ground. Despite coming perilously close to being discovered by the guards, he skillfully employed a ladder he found in a nearby custodial closet and a scraper to gingerly detach the artwork from the wall. He meticulously exited the palazzo, then delivered the stolen masterpiece to the local mafia. Within hours, a janitor noticed the absence of the Madonna Col Bambino, prompting Detective Palmozzi to launch an investigation. This heist was on a scale akin to pilfering the U.S. Constitution from the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., nearly impossible. Right from the outset, it was evident that only Pipino possessed the audacity and skill to pull it off. The Quest for Retrieval The theft of the Madonna Col Bambino was no longer something the police or the wealthy could ignore. It had ceased to be a harmless act. It was the theft of one of Venice's most cherished symbols, a national calamity that demanded a proportionate response. Palmosi met Peppino at their customary cafe and calmly informed him that he would face a protracted prison sentence unless the painting was returned. There was no room for negotiation. It had to be done. Palmosi afforded him a mere twenty days to make amends. The residence housing the painting was guarded by two formidable tigers not to mention a retinue of heavily armed mafia enforcers. To earn the police's forgiveness, Pipino would need to forge a replica, infiltrate the residence where the genuine painting was housed, navigate past the tigers, and execute the covert swap. It appeared to be a virtually insurmountable mission, but could he truly achieve the impossible? The final heist remains shrouded in mystery with conflicting accounts. Yet in the dead of night, the painting eventually found its way into the hands of law enforcement. Peppino himself maintains that he was not responsible for the painting's return, but the sedated Tigers and Palmosi's version of events suggest otherwise. The concluding chapter of Vincenzo Peppino's extraordinary thieving career remains an enigma, despite his publication of a book on the subject in 2010. With a character like his, distinguishing fact from fiction proves to be a daunting task. Much like Lupin III, Peppino's tale transcends reality and becomes a legend. How he accomplished it, whether he did it at all, or if he struck a deal with the Mafia to secure its return, these are questions that may never be definitively answered. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to our channel.